speaker, Dr. Asante Hatcher. Uh, we actually went to graduate school together. Um, so a few people on the call know him. Um, he graduated in 2019 with his PhD in neuroscience from Baylor, like I just said. Um, there he studied multiple facets of glioma and glioblastoma, such as seizure activity and contributing astrocyte populations. So after finishing his degree in 2019, he started working as an application specialist for Leica Biosystems. So this field experience that he had and his research background helped him to get his first MSL position in neurology with Bristol Myers Squibb. Uh, he landed that job in fall of 2020, so he has nice new experience for us. Um, and for today's webinar, he's going to be discussing his experience with the onboarding and training processes, as well as overall tips for people starting the role. Uh, so with that, I'd like to welcome Asante, and um, I think he can just give a quick little introduction, and then we'll start with some of the questions that you guys all submitted for us. Yeah, thank you. Um, that was a really good intro. I don't really have terribly much to say besides that. Actually. <laughs> um, yeah, started um, prior to coming down to Baylor for grad school. I uh, did a post back at Tufts University in Boston um, because I just wasn't really sure if if the PhD was for me. Um, and actually being up there because of the amount of industry that's in Boston, I was able to get exposure not only to um, the translational research side of things, but also interact with people who were in industry. So I had an inkling that I wanted to go more industry than academic coming into grad school, but not sure. Obviously doing the PhD, I wanted to be fully immersed in the academic world, see how that goes. And it was just really through doing events like this, uh, career development stuff, as I was doing my PhD training, that I learned about MSL and other roles, um, not academic or quote unquote, non-traditional roles in science. Um, so just happy to be here and be able to hopefully answer questions for people that are going on that track now, just like I had other people answer those questions for me um, coming through my training. So, yeah. All right, perfect. So to start, um, we'll kind of just start with a general question. Um, what are one or two things that you did that made the most impact for you transitioning into the MSL role? So maybe whether it was job experience or some skill development that you had. Mm -hmm. um, great question. One or two things, I'd say the two biggest were uh, job experience. So in grad school and after grad school, and also uh, developing my soft skills through outreach and volunteering experience. Um, so of course, to be an MSL, you have to have a strong scientific background or a clinical scientific background. Um, so working in a translational research area absolutely helped. That was what I was interested in in any way, but um, understanding how a disease works from a molecular biology point of view is super crucial to an MSL. Um, when you're working on these MSL teams, it's not just PhDs, it's PhDs and uh, sometimes MDs, people with clinical research experience, um, nurse practitioners, PAs, people like that. And then you also have people who understand drugs from more of a, a farm to your pharmacological perspective. So uh, you have to look at it as not just getting an MSL role, but what does your expertise bring to the team? Because they're trying to balance it out by having a, a number of scientific perspectives. So if you're working in translation or um, maybe if you're just working more in, in basic biology, just under be able to uh, understand disease states at a molecular level, even the, if that's not your exact area of expertise, try and get a side project or something like that, uh, just working on a disease state, or maybe if you're um, in more of the biopharma side of PhD, that's really helpful too. And then, um, so this answer doesn't go too long, I'll keep the second part brief. Soft skills, outreach, a lot of MSL work is interacting with healthcare providers, cold calling, coming into offices, interacting with people that you've not really met before, but sharing your scientific information with them. So if you have any type of science outreach or science communication groups at your university or uh, wherever you're working or in your community, those are really great for helping develop those soft skills. And also I think we lost you for a second, Asante. Is it just me? No, he just went, his whole screen just went black. Okay. Like he's still in here, but. Mm. 
maybe he's trying to leave and come back. Okay, yeah, it's just frozen. His screen is just frozen for me. I can technically remove somebody. Oh, I think he just he might be coming back in. Let me see if he's in. Okay, yeah, I think he crossed out and is going to come back in. Hopefully this isn't connection issues like we had a few months ago. <laughs> For those who remember. <laughs> yeah, how's the Texas power grid these days? <laughs> Probably still struggling. <laughs> um, gonna pull up LinkedIn and see if I should message him. Oh, there he is. Oh, he's back. Okay. Um, seems like the internet went out. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm joined from my phone for the time being. How far did I get in that answer before you lost me? Um, you were talking about trying to participate in science outreach, science communication to develop mm -hmm. soft skills. Oh, yeah. Essentially, those things are going to be crucial to um, any MSO role because a lot of your job is educating people who don't have the data or maybe the knowledge base that you do. So being in a science outreach position where you're doing that on a regular basis to people in your community um, is in a way an analog for managing a territory. So um, another really useful thing you can do to make yourself more marketable. Great. Um, and along those same lines, we actually have a question about managing your territory before we sort of get into more of the onboarding related questions. So a few people were curious about since you didn't have experience and you weren't necessarily um, sure about how to how to develop your plan to manage that territory. Did you go about preparing a 30, 60, 90 day plan either for your interview or once you got started? And what was your process in doing that? I did go about preparing a 30, 60, 90 day plan um, for my interview. And a lot of that thought process was one, having people who are in current MSL roles. Also, I might be able to join by my computer again. Let me see if that'll, oh, is it gonna work? Hold on. Okay, we're back. Um, all right. So 30, 60, 90 plan, talking to other MSLs who've developed their own and understanding from a practical standpoint, having them look over mine and figuring out, okay, what things should I leave in? What things should I leave out? What am I missing um, as far as 30, 60, 90? Because I kind of just put something together, much like your first time doing a resume and said, does this make sense? And they go, no, you're not actually going to do that. Or, oh yeah, they said that on the internet, but um, it's not an important part of 30, 60, 90. And uh, I had mine ready. And I will say when I got to the interview, um, I busted it out and said, hey, I have this 30, 60, 90. If you want to talk through some of that, how I'd be in the role. And then uh, the hiring manager said, no, 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 no. Uh, that's really great that you had it, but we don't need that. <laughs> We're going to do things a little differently here. So your mileage may vary with the 30, 60, 90, but, and I haven't really looked at it since because internally they have their own developmental procedures and goals, but uh, it's something that you should prepare coming into an interview just so they know that you're taking it seriously and you have an idea of how you want to develop uh, coming into an MSL role. Yeah, I've definitely heard a lot of uh, about the 30, 60, 90 day plan online. So I think it's important to know that we should be preparing that. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so we're going to move on to really the main topic, which is the onboarding process, which you recently went through. Um, mm -hmm. So of course there are internal things that you can't discuss because of your company, but in general, could you give an overview of what your onboarding process was like? Sure, yeah. The onboarding process, at least for my team at BMS, was eight weeks long. Um, so it is eight weeks of intense study, uh, really, so you can learn all things within your disease state. Uh, they send me a bunch, it's like being back in undergrad or first year grad school, sent me a bunch of textbooks, uh, a bunch of PDFs, a bunch of lectures, and it's really going to vary one from therapeutic area to therapeutic area, and 
even from MSL team. It, it depends on what they decide is the most effective way to train people. Um, but yeah, for us, it was eight weeks of really intense learning. You're not in the field. You're not building your territory yet. Your job is just to become an expert in your therapeutic area. Um, for me, that's neurology and <clears throat> understand what's in your pipeline, uh, what's what's coming to market, what might not be at market, and um, really get some early perspective on the also the competitor space. So other drugs that might be in the market in your same therapeutic area. Uh, really just a holistic education. And then at the end, you have a checkout exam. Uh, so they'll have a slide deck usually prepared by the company is usually only presenting uh, vetted materials. And you have to be able to speak to that slide deck competently, present all the information in it, and then answer any questions as if you'd actually be, in, be meeting with a key opinion leader uh, to demonstrate that <clears throat> you have a basic grasp of the material, uh, that you understand how to pivot in a conversation with an HTP and do a little bit of that probing for, for deep understanding, really get make sure that you're meeting their needs in those meetings. And um, also that you know more importantly, super important in every aspect of science, say when you don't know something. Uh, because right now you're, because when you're out in the field as an MSL, you're representative of your company and you're also dealing with uh, products that are, you know, they're, they're cleared by the FDA. So uh, you, you're not there to give diagnostic advice or um, treatment advice specifically, just scientific information, uh, but realize that, that in, that's information that healthcare providers are using. So if you don't know, don't make up the answer. Uh, <laughs> Just learning how to say, I don't know, uh, but knowing where your resources are because you did that eight weeks of training and being able to go, okay, when we get off this call, I'm gonna find the resources you need. I'm gonna get back to you. So it's a lot of that. Any questions regarding that uh, that I might not have addressed? I have a quick question, Asante. It, is mm -hmm. that exam that you have to take kind of like a qualifying exam? Like you're in front of a panel of people and you're presenting and they kind of peg you with questions? Yes, but it's not, at least here, I can't speak for every organization, it's not uh, quite as stressful as a, as a qualifying exam because there's no pass or fail. They hired you to be part of the organization because they believe you have the skills and the, the tool set or skill set and tools to be an MSL. Um, they're not there to grill you. They're just there to help you understand what it's going to be like going to the field. And also before you step out into the field and start having these conversations, make sure there are no areas that you don't um, need any more work or polish. Of course, you're gonna continue getting better as you do the job, um, but just saying, hey, before you set up your first meeting, you might need to go into drug-drug interactions a little bit more um, because there were a couple of questions you were shaky on there. So just, just to check you, not to like pass or fail you, check you up, yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, I think being handed all, all those materials is probably pretty overwhelming at first. And a few people are wondering, what types of checkpoints do you have throughout the onboarding process? Or is it primarily self-study? Um, kind of, do you meet with your hiring manager throughout that phase, or is it just that meeting at the end? Good question. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, I would say, yeah, you're meeting with your hiring manager regularly they're not typically directly in charge of your training because they're still managing the territory and the MSLs that are out in the field. You're typically meeting with the uh, training manager more frequently, well, usually a weekly check-in at the beginning of the week to, to say, hey, this is what you should be covering this week. Were there any questions from last week? Uh, is there anything that you feel like you need more detail on? And also as a training manager, is uh, there anything, any feedback you can give me to modify this training for whoever's gonna onboard next? Mm -hmm and you have regular check-ins with the members of your team. So usually everybody's hands-on. You're gonna be having different meetings during the week with different team members um, covering different aspects of that training. A lot of times on an MSL team, people are assigned uh, different things. You know, a lot of the job is, is gathering information and being a scientific expert. So have different people who are keeping their fingers on the pulse of different things in your therapeutic area uh, within neurology for me. So. Uh, Whoever's the expert on one competitor's drug will be a thing. Whoever's an expert on, um, lately it's been COVID-19. So COVID-19 and, and our disease state and have different presentations on that. So it's not only a way to get training, but also to meet your team members and start to build a rapport with people in other territories. 
And um, besides that, a lot of it also becomes self-directed. So everybody's doing their own thing, <clears throat> actually working full time. So if you feel like you need more work or to go over something again, because you've built those connections with those initial trainings that team members have given you, it's then kind of on you to, to reach out and say, hey, do you, can we meet again and go over uh, what you presented to us last week? Or, hey, training manager, um, I need like an hour with you to really drill down on something specific. So uh, a mix of both, I'd say. Cool. Just out of what curiosity. Would you say, yeah. um, oh, sorry, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, is the training manager somebody within your team? Like, is it another MSL that you're working with? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Another MSL who is assigned the role of training lead. Okay, cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, not sure that it goes that way everywhere. Sorry, Lindsay. What was your question? No, that's fine. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure at different companies, they have different people who are maybe in charge of that role, but... Mm -hmm. Um, what would you say through this whole onboarding process was the most challenging for you? Hmm. That's a really good one. Uh, the most challenging thing for onboarding was learning how to speak clinician, I would say. Uh, because if you're coming here from a PhD background or, or really a lab science background, you have a tendency to, when you're presented with a paper or something like that, really delve into the, the molecular mechanisms, really delve into the experiments, the pitfalls. Oh, this N was kind of low. Um, oh, they could have used a different assay for this. But you have to realize that people who are making treatment decisions don't necessarily care about the same things that you do. And while on the MSL side, that's gonna add a lot of value to your team to make sure they have the, the broadest scope of knowledge possible. Um, when it's somebody who has 15 minutes or 20 minutes to talk to you coming from clinic, they don't want to get into those nuts and bolts. Uh, they want to know the, some, a lot of times the high level implications and what that means for uh, their practice as far as your, your therapy is concerned. So have, realize, getting better at stepping back and zooming out and not getting as much into the weeds as you do in a journal club or something like that, or um, at a weekly seminar, I'd say, yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So in terms of feeling ready and, and being able to talk clinician and passing that final presentation phase, what is the actual point at which you're deemed field ready and who determines that? Is it just that presentation and then you're set free the next day? Or how do you kind of start planning those meetings with KOLs um, after feeling like you can talk the talk and, and pass that final presentation phase? Yep. After you finish the presentation, you are deemed field ready. That is, that is it. And then they never talk to you again. No, um, I'm kidding. Uh, after that, you, and I'm, am I breaking up? Am I good? Okay. Um, after that, you, it really depends on your hiring manager. So different territory managers have different approaches to how people are set up in the field. Some of them will say, um, I've already set up a bunch of intros for you and we're going to go through one by one. Uh, some others will give you a list that the previous MSL might have had of, of KOLs that you should be reaching out to and um, say, okay, here's your list. And oh, you should start reaching out to people. Just start sending intro emails. Usually it's a mix of the two. And on your own time, you're also working with uh, what you'd call your matrix partners. So people on the commercial side of the organization that might have been calling on these offices. I, I will say that it's important to note that there are very discrete silos between commercial and field medical. So there are certain things, rules around what you can and can't say to somebody on the commercial side, um, whether you're allowed to meet with commercial and an ACP. Like there's, there's time limits to how long that can go on depending on the organization. But they can be a really useful general resource to, if you're handed this list of KOLs, just saying, um, not showing them your list, but saying, hey, uh, Dr. So-and-so is, is um, are they somebody that you think is important in the field? And then they can tell you because they've been out and about, oh yeah, they are uh, really big in your territory. There's probably somebody you should be talking to. And then you go, you can kind of start to set priority on your list of, okay, these are people that I really need to know. These are people that are maybe not as much in that disease space, or um, these are people that nobody knows yet, but I might've found them via Googling. So it's, uh, I hope that was a, a good enough answer. It's a mix of, I'm going to hold your hand for a little bit, but eventually you got to go out there and kind of 
learn in the area, be the eyes and ears. Seems like that would be a bit overwhelming to start. I think <laughs> getting <laughs> kind of thrown out there and just going for it, but it, obviously it, you have to. <laughs> yeah, it is. And the first year of an MSO role is, most everybody will tell you the first year is kind of a, a learning year. Um, you're really understanding how to get these meetings, how to get in front of HCPs, how to build your territory, um, prioritize, like I said, different people in your territory, and um, also how to do that investigative work, like how to look for recently published papers and figure out, oh, these authors in my area, maybe they'd be interested in meeting and talking more about the, the work they're doing. Uh, that first year is really, and I'm still in it, it's only been, it's been several months, but still feel like I'm really grasping what it means to MSL day to day. And you kind of just got to take it week by week. You can't just email everybody at once. Um, just say this week, I'm gonna email these people. I didn't get a response. I'll try again in two weeks. And um, in that time, you're still meeting with other people who might have more experience on your team, including your manager. Um, just saying, hey, I, I got a meeting with, with somebody. Can you give me some pointers on how to handle it? This is what they want to talk about. And because they've been doing this for years, it's easy to them. Like, oh yeah, yeah, you pull up the deck and go through. But for you, they're walking you through their process and you're kind of learning and adapting from what you see other people in the field doing and figuring out what styles and uh, as far as structuring your meetings and delivering the science communication uh, work best for you. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, before moving on, I'm just gonna check in. There's a couple uh, questions in the chat. Um, so since Jacqueline knows a bit about your background, um, she was wondering, since you worked under a clinician um, during your PhD, did you feel like that was enough exposure to communicating with clinicians or you really feel that um, there's more that you, you should be doing? That was really good. I would say that's, that's super useful actually, because uh, yeah, I worked with him who was a clinician, but also we had two other MDs in our lab group. And we went to, I was in epilepsy, so we went to the American Epilepsy Society every year. Uh, so that was a heavily clinically based conference. So that really gave me an insight into the mindset of people who are, who are in clinic because I came with my translational background and I sit in on some of those clinical sessions and like, oh wow, they're really not talking about this disease the same way I would. Like, mm -hmm. I'm worried about what transcription factor makes the microglia more active over time and they're not worried about that. They're worried about, okay, these are the drugs we've tried. These are like a bunch of MRI and, and other patient readouts. And I'm looking at that and going, oh, I didn't. Okay. So that helped me take that back to the bench and kind of adapt my work to um, eventually publish in more of a clinical translational journal. Uh, probably wouldn't have been able to think like that without it, I'd say. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the job that I worked after graduating was also really important, application specialist, because working in cancer pathology, I was in a lot of hospitals. And um, again, having face-to-face -face conversations with a bunch of different uh, MDs every day, every week. And that was really helpful too, that FaceTime. So both are important. Yeah. Um, all right, there's a couple of questions in the chat, but I think they potentially will get covered a bit. So I'm just gonna hold off on them for right now. Um, so speaking of actually starting your role, um, what would you say, well, I guess we kind of covered that. Okay. What would you say a typical day in the life is like for you as an MSL? Okay. Day in the life varies. I will, everybody who's listening to this, take this with the caveat of one, I'm new and two, because it's been COVID. I've never actually been out in the field. lose them again i think so so i imagine my day oh, did he just leave yeah okay maybe he'll just join back on his phone mm -hmm. here he is
This internet is not cooperating with me today. It's killing me. Of all days. It's yeah, all right. Okay. Um, the question was the... Day -day. Okay. Yeah. So new MSL, COVID times, everything virtual. I'm waking up in the morning, checking my Microsoft Teams to see if there's any new updates from the, the team members, information in the field that paper somebody want to find. Checking my email um, to see if there's any follow-up on meeting requests I might have sent that day and checking my calendar to see if I have any meetings to, <laughs> with HCPs that day that I that I uh, might have forgotten about. Not usually the case though. Um, and then I'm, I'm sending out a couple emails too. So again, following up on, I know there was a request for information on different topics, following up on those or maybe sending intro requests because I'm still trying to build up the territory. And uh, then an important thing also, if you're a new MSL would be keeping your own document of not only that list of people in your territory, but um, people that you might have reached out to, you might not have, and um, just because it's always going to be in flux. So going down my list and saying, oh, okay, I've, I've made contact with this many people in my territory. This is who requested a follow-up on specific information, because a lot of your meetings are, are reactive. You're not allowed to just come up to people and start talking to them. It has to be when people request specific things, or um, uh, following up on internal things. That's that's all going through the to-dos, how you start your day. And um, based on what's on the schedule, it, it changes accordingly. If I know I have an 8.30 meeting with, with a healthcare provider, I'm doing that. And then after that, I'm uh, logging any insights that I might've gotten from that meeting and then um, scheduling a follow-up if they requested a follow-up or uh, obtaining information, materials that I might need to email them, going through that process. And then I'm attending internal meetings. Uh, I'm scheduling travel if I need to schedule my travel and uh, then figuring out what's for the rest of the week or uh, what's going on the next week. Always really trying to stay one week ahead of where I am, uh, especially because everybody's so busy, especially with everything being virtual um, and not losing that momentum. So even if it's a meeting, a week where I have light actual meetings or engagements with people in my territory, uh, I'm always churning and working in the background to set up something for one, two, three, sometimes a month out. Uh, so there's, there's always something on the back burner, but um, some days are, are busier than others. Some days it's only internal meetings and just sending out emails and seeing what happens. And then I'm just reading papers and uh, trying to stay up to date on the latest information. So I had a quick um, clarification question. So right now you're not doing in-person meetings with Healthcare providers, or you are? Uh, is that's a tricky question. I am technically clear to, and it depends on which company you're working for. Okay. Uh, especially vaccination status, but if you're starting an MSL position in the next year or in the next few months, um, one thing you have to realize is that even though a lot of people are getting their vaccines and uh, organizations are transitioning the field, especially larger larger organizations, it's a little harder to manage on our side because it's a lot of moving parts. Um, you don't know who is and who is not vaccinated. You have concerns about employees being in the same place or moving through the same ter territory at the same time. And um, moreover, these healthcare providers have a lot of times have to make the transition to telemedicine over the last year. So even though you are ready for in-person meetings, they might not be ready for in-person meetings. Um, their schedule just might not have adjusted or adapted to that yet. So some people in some territories are like, yeah, everybody wants to meet in person and others are, you know, I've really adjusted to this virtual meetings with pharma thing. I'd rather just do it all virtually for now and maybe let's explore in person in the next few months. So um, while I technically can meet in person, it's everything's kind of still in the transitional phase. And if you're starting an MSL role, it's probably going to be similar no matter what organization you're in. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I've heard from a few people that a lot of um, organizations are kind of leaning towards a hybrid model for the foreseeable future whenever people feel fully comfortable, which may not be for a yeah. while. So that makes sense. Probably the um, next, so I feel like, oh, the yeah, next year is probably going to be hybrid. No, that's it. It looks like your internet uh, bars are flashing from red to yellow on my screen. So <sighs> I don't know if we're going to lose you again soon. <laughs> All right. I'm going to. Yeah, if you ask a question, I'll try and switch to fully virtual Just give me <laughs> or fully mobile. Just give me a second. Okay. I can answer. I can answer on on sales speaker. Okay, cool. <laughs> 
Um, so your, your answer was actually a perfect segue to our next section of questions. Could you tell us about your first KOL meeting? How did you get a hold of the KOL? What were you mostly concerned about? Were you nervous? What, were, what kind of things were you feeling and, and how did it end up going? Great question. Okay, my first KOL meeting. Let me see if I can remember it correctly. Um, so like I said, a lot of what you're doing in the role is reacting to requests for information from healthcare providers, uh, whether it comes through an automated system, not automated system, whether it's in an email through the internal system or uh, reacting to something you might've had in a previous meeting. And that was my first KOL, um, my first KOL meeting. It was, it had come across while still in the training phase to somebody who was covering my territory. And when I got cleared for check out um they said hey this request for medical information came across and so i scheduled the meeting emailed them said hey you have you had this request for medical information do you want to meet they said yes i in my brain had this picture of a fantastic meeting where we laughed we talked science everything was fantastic they said you're the best new msl i've ever seen <laughs> the reality was a bit different. It was supposed to be a 30 minute meeting. Uh, they had to run black to clinic. So they actually said, yeah, I actually only have 10. Can we cover everything in that time? <laughs> so I had this prepared spiel, but a lot of the MSO job is adjusting on the fly. Um, so I really said, okay, well, what do you have time to cover? And we can break everything else into a separate meeting. I was very nervous, um, but we got through it. And it kind of grilled me on a couple questions, but you know, it, it worked out. And I will say that a lot of people who were more senior MSLs did warn me that that's how it's gonna go sometimes, uh, that you'll have these really great meetings and you come back from it and go, oh my gosh, MSL is amazing. I never wanna do any other job ever. But you'll have other meetings where, you know, maybe you don't answer the question the way you wanted, maybe, time ran out, uh, maybe you don't feel like they got everything that they needed out of the meeting, uh, but you gotta, you gotta take them as they come and uh, just realize that it's part of doing the job, learning and also learning to adapt. Just like I'm putting my phone on a tripod to switch this meeting virtually, so things happen, so yeah. Um, have you found that during the more you have these meetings that your confidence has increased? Um, if you at all in the beginning felt unconfident or do you feel like you're still kind of just taking it day to day? Uh, I would say confidence has increased a lot. Yes, because you, over time, you're gonna get more comfortable. Like I said, especially coming from a bench scientist background, um, speaking the language that people who are more in a healthcare setting speak, uh, you're gonna get more confidence with the materials themselves, uh, because you're not, uh, I can't speak for any or every organization, but to my knowledge, a lot of times you're not, you're not making your presentations. It's not like, uh, not like giving a talk in academia where it's your data and you're presenting it in the way that you always present your PowerPoints. A lot of times you're, 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 you're given, you're given products to present. And so you have to figure out how to adapt your speaking style to the materials that are given to you to present to people. Um, so yeah, you get more comfortable with the data, the presentation style, you get more comfortable having these meetings and, and building rapport. And you also get uh, more comfortable with a big part of it, which is collecting insights. Um, so really understanding, understand, get to understand people in your territory and um, understand how, how they feel about the information you're giving them and uh, what are the gaps in data and information that you can then take back to your organization as a liaison, this is a two-way thing, right? Take back to your organization and say, hey, healthcare providers in my territory um, need more information on X, Y, and Z. So that's all part of it and repetition. Repetition and, and talking to people on your team to get better. Um, you mentioned, uh, you've been mentioning obviously like the materials that you have to read and things like that. Um, we did have a question in the chat. Um, so when you're staying up to date on either drugs or your therapeutic area, um, mm -hmm. are you kind of doing what we do in grad school where you're searching PubMed and you're looking up 
you know, recently published literature or are there sources that are coming directly from your company that you're staying on top of? Uh, great question. It is a mix of both. So a lot of times you'll, again, can't speak for everywhere, but you will get a notification that new materials have been released and it's, you get the opportunity to go over it on your own and then also discuss it with kind of dissected deep dive conversations uh, with people on your MSL team. But besides that, you are, like I said, I wake up in the morning, check Microsoft Teams, uh, check the team chat and see if anybody's posted any cool new articles. They might have gotten their PubMed alerts or on pharma blogs or things like that. And you're also looking at the things that people in your territory are publishing. So a lot of people have alerts uh, for specific K uh, K T wow, KOLs that uh, they know publish regularly. Um, so you're trying to kind of keep a hand on everything. It can get a little hectic at times, but um, yeah, a mix of internal and external because while your job as a medical science liaison is to liaise, take the information from my organization, give it to uh, TLs, and then bring back information from them, you're also collecting from sources outside. And um, while I can't really talk to uh, KOLs about the outside stuff quite as much, I can then take that and bring it back to people internally and say, hey, this is what the buzz has been about, at least in my area. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I also feel like probably you can make that decision on your own too, when you feel you have more free time and maybe you have a day with not too many meetings and you know, you're not really having any other internal obligations. Do you kind of take it upon yourself to hit up PubMed and see what you can find or sort of oh, yeah. how do you tackle, I don't want to say free time, but how do you tackle a day that's not <laughs> as busy as another day? Yeah, a day that's not as busy, that's, that is exactly it. That's a lot of what you do. Um, just checking PubMed, uh, checking if you are, depending on your disease state, there's a lot of local science outreach societies. And you can see if they're hosting any virtual events, uh, see if any of your key opinion leaders are, a lot, it's a lot easier now that things are virtual, hosting grand rounds or any other speaking engagements. Um, because you're new to the disease state a lot of times and the MSL job. So it's really just trying to get as good a handle on the information and, and the comings and goings of different people as possible. So a lot of that, uh, brushing up on like those internally provided materials, um, making sure that you know, the information is fresh because you could be in the middle of a conversation and it shifts to like you came in to talk about I'm not going to name specific things, like compliance, but you came in to talk about one thing, they had a question about one thing, and then the conversation pivots completely to another. Um, so you don't want to say, well, if you don't know, you don't know, but it's nice if you're fresh on other information, uh, other aspects of the drug, because on your off day, I went through that slide deck a couple of times, and then you go, oh yeah, I can pull that up, we can talk about that. That looks good. Um, so on the off days, just keeping yourself sharp as far as the information you've already learned, making sure you still know it well, and then trying to supplement that with, with new stuff. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, uh, another question that we had um, is what goals do you set for yourself within the first six months of starting your role? Hmm. First goal would be to check out. Absolutely. Um, second goal would be, uh, you can kind of refer to 30, 60, 90 if, if it's okay. Second goal is to, if I was traveling, it would be to do some actual ride-alongs and see how other people in my company MSL. And then third would be to uh, start making my own appointments, um, start building a rapport with people in my territory. Uh, one thing I've heard a lot of senior MSLs say is that your biggest goal is to let them know that you're a reliable resource. If they have a random question on your, in something in your therapeutic area, you want to be the person that pops into their head and they go, instead of Googling it for themselves or just say, I'll figure that out eventually, you want to be the person that's top of mind uh, that they say, oh yeah, I should email or I should call or I should text Sante and see if we can set up a quick call or a meeting so I can get that information. Um, 
so really just cementing your reef self as a resource after you've checked out and then after you've shadowed some of their MSLs and see how they're doing it, uh, beginning to build your territory and, and book some meetings. Uh, you're, you're not going to be best buddies with everybody in your territory sometimes ever, but just getting those few under your belt saying, okay, there's a few months in, six months in, I got two or three people that I, I know I can call on, that I know if we get a new data update, those are the ones that I need to be emailing, calling and say, hey, we need to schedule a meeting. And um, beyond that, just being patient and continuing to build. Yeah, that makes sense. That's probably one of the most critical parts of the job that you don't really think about as needing to set time apart or set time aside to actually work on. But I'm sure it takes a little while before you trust yourself and then also to establish that rapport enough that somebody would trust you to call on you with an important question. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I think we're going to move on to our third section of questions, which would be relationships with your team and with your, your supervisors. So a lot of people always have questions about metrics and reporting. So for your specific position, because I'm sure this varies from company to company, but who do you report to and how often does that occur on a formal basis? And um, what kind of feedback do you get? So I, that's kind of a loaded question, but feedback, metrics, and reporting. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about those things. And like you said, it's it's different in every organization. I don't know how much about the specific metrics I can talk about, um, but I can speak in a more general sense to how it's structured. Um, you normally have a regional manager, uh, so a regional director, and then the national director. Um, so the way our team is structured, I report to my regional director, um, there's no set amount of times I have to talk to them. We do have uh, weekly or bi-weekly regional team calls where we check in, give any updates, things like that. Otherwise, it's kind of up to you to schedule a regular meeting um, with your directors. And it, it's really not on every team, but at least here, it's, it's up to our discretion. So if we want to meet every week, I can put something on a schedule for every week, especially because I'm new. Um, if it's bi-weekly, then bi-weekly. Uh, and um, that can be for both the national director, and he's a little more busy. Uh, well, they're both busy, but yeah, at, at both levels, you can kind of reach out when you need to reach out uh, to ask questions to understand because there's so much expertise and knowledge. And besides that, similar to the rapport that you're establishing during checkout with other people, them coming in and helping you uh, with learn, getting expertise, that continues post checkout too. So there's some people I have weekly or biweekly standing meetings with um, just to say, hey, this is what's on my mind. This is what I've experienced in the field. Uh, do you have any input on this? And then also establishing um, genial relationships with your team members is super important too, because your whole thing is, is uh, so much of the job is exchange of information. You want to feel comfortable with your, your teammates, not just I have a work thing and then here it is and, and bye, but having conversations with your teammates and feeling like you have each other's back um, because like i said different people have different areas of expertise and you want to feel like you want them to feel like it, as in addition to your your uh, kols you want them to feel like you're somebody you can call on so you know, on, on my team i'm the the neuroscience and, and brain cancer guy and, and epilepsy and things related to that so something comes up with with seizures uh related to any drug or something like that. I want people on the team to feel like they can come to me for information. And um, I will same for somebody who maybe has more of a PharmD background. And um, that's on my regional team and at the national level. Um, is there a way that you keep track of your own progress, um, whether that's informal or a formal way you have to keep track of progress? Yeah, there are team development plans and then there are also individual development plans. If you have not worked in a um, biopharma or actually any corporate space yet, there's this entire platform called Workday that you will get very familiar with. And Workday is a lot of times how organizations will um, track your performance via these metrics. So it's kind of a, a list that you will work with your team and your manager to develop. Uh, so whether it's team goals, the things, the targets you're trying to hit for the year, or individual performance goals. And um, it's something that you can regularly go into the platform and, and check on throughout the year. So 
kind of figure out, okay, six months in, this is what I set out to do. This is where I am. And then um, depending on the organization, there might be a mid-year review where it's not necessarily they're trying to ding you on anything or like that, but just being new to a role, you check in with, with your manager, um, either regional or national, and say, hey, this is where I'm in my development plan. How do you think I'm doing? What can I do to improve? Um, so yeah, workday development plans are probably the main way that myself and everyone else will keep track of those things. So one of the other questions um, that a few people had is, it's all about the challenges. So what do you think has been one of the most challenging aspects for you, either in the virtual environment or uh, regardless of being virtual? What do you think has been an unexpected uh, challenge that you had to face? I would say that sometimes getting a meeting with a key opinion leader is harder than booking a committee meeting. Uh, <laughs> which if any of you had that experience, sometimes it's like, uh, I sent out the doodle poll three times and yeah. it's, <laughs> it's not working. So yeah, I, I think being new to the role, sometimes it's, it's very easy to um, think that you're operating in a vacuum. Like I me emailed them for a meeting or they asked me a question and they haven't responded to my follow-up, even though they had a question. Um, why? What's going on? Why can't I get this meeting? But you have to realize that they are seeing patients all day, sometimes from 7 a.m. to whenever they get off. And then they have charts to go over and a bunch of things like that. And that you're not the only MSL calling on them. That there's probably 20 other MSLs from other companies, people from clinical research org organizations, um, patients with follow-up emails, things like that. Their inbox is super full all the time. Uh, so having to step back and have that perspective and realize that I'm not the only person calling on them. So even if they want to meet, they might've just missed my message. They might just be too busy right now. And um, having the patience to realize that, yes, I'm in my first year, these things will develop in time. It's uh, not like running an essay at the bench where you kind of know if you messed up or you didn't mess up. Uh, like, did I get the data or did I not get the data? And then I can run the analysis on it. Sometimes these things are a, a lot more of a long game. Sometimes you might have one really great intro meeting with somebody and then they get super busy with the next group of residents that come in for the, the next four or five months. You have to realize they have responsibilities outside of you. And um, all you can do is, is do your job the best you can and that um, things will line up the more that you, you get experience. All right, so now um, we're getting close to the end of the hour, so we don't want to keep you too long. Um, so we're just going to hit a couple of quick questions that we had in the chat. Um, do you have a hard stop at the hour, Asante? No. Okay, we won't go too long, just wanted to, to make sure. Um, so somebody asked, what is the toughest question that a KOL has posed to you? So, you know, maybe you can't answer specifics, obviously, but what was, <laughs> yeah, what was like the theme of the question? Was it tough because um, you didn't know the information or was it tough because they were asking something outside of your scope? And really, how did you handle that? Out of scope questions are always the toughest questions. Um, things where you just either don't have that data or it's not really related to your product. And I think I mentioned this when I was talking about the checkout exam. One thing they're trying to get you used to is asking probing questions, um, gleaning more information from them. And uh, that's learning how to do that when it's an out of scope question is, is pretty difficult because if you don't know the answer, then you need to know like, why they want that information. What about their day to day experience has led them to that question? Um, and why is it important for them to have that information? Because if it's something that you truly don't have in your organization at all, data-wise, then you can't just go back to your organization, um, to other people on your team, to management, to whoever, and say, there was a question about this. And you want to know, okay, well, why? Did it happen to them? Is it something they're worried about? What have you? So um, instead of just going right away, I don't know, which is important to eventually say, I don't know. Don't just say, I don't know, but uh, kind of pivot and ask back, oh, that's really interesting. What makes you ask that? Like, 
having getting used to having that reaction and uh, turning it from I just don't know to we're still having an informational exchange and I'll get back to you on that now that I understand uh, why this is important to you and how you'd like me to answer the questions in the future. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, that's a, a good thing to keep in the back of your mind is obviously you're not going to have the answers to all of the questions. Um, this is sort of a question that I have that I just thought of that's related. How often do you find yourself reaching out to either other teams or other departments, be it maybe commercial or med, med info? Do you ever have to reach out to other departments to get answers for things? Um, I don't reach out to med info quite as much. But uh, definitely people, other people in the team all the time. Okay. Uh, just because whether it's tips on engagement or uh, tips on, on the data. Actually, after this, I'm going to email a couple colleagues and say, hey, we, we just got um, new information on something and going to say, hey, do you want to go through it together? Uh, just so I can make sure my, my spiel is OK. There's no parts where I'm missing information or um, and asking them importantly what kind of questions do you get when you present this uh, because i haven't really done it yet so definitely have to leverage all your resources especially because even in a non-covid environment uh, you're not going to be coming into it's not like coming into a lab or coming into an office every day it's usually just you and your territory so it's kind of on you to keep those connections up and continuing to ask questions of people who've been doing it longer than you and because they're still there clearly have had some success at it. I hope that answers your question. All right, um, maybe we'll do one or two more. Um, have you had to prepare for a conference yet? And if so, how did you prepare? Or have there not been opportunities for that? Yeah, yeah, they've all been virtual. Um, but I will say that's uh, also a completely new process to me. Uh, yeah, so normally you go, when you're going to a conference, you kind of pick the posters. Well, some labs, they get assigned, uh, but you kind of pick the posters, sessions, stuff like that, that's of interest to you or that you might be useful, and then you go to them. Um, but there's a lot, there's a whole medical strategy team that's uh, involved in, um, yeah, months out. They're planning how your field medical team is going to break down the conference. Uh, so different people are assigned different posters and talks. Um, you're not necessarily required, but expected to go to things uh, related to your therapeutic area. You have to look for different posters and talks that your KOLs might be giving. And um, you're really just trying to collect as much information as possible. And then not only that, but you're, you're triaging usually throughout the week and definitely after the conference too. Everybody's getting together and sharing with each other um, what they found, what was cool, what people seem to be talking about, what they didn't seem to be talking about, um, and really just getting reactions and, and finding new and exciting stuff. So it kind of turns from just casual conversation to you're really trying to plug into the conference. Um, but also because you are working as part of pharma, you can't actively participate in the way that you normally would as an academic. Like, um, because you don't want any issues with compliance or, or interference with, with talks or any image of impropriety. So you're really just standing back and taking everything in um, and gathering information that you can to, to share with your team. Great, thanks. So we want to ask you a question that we save for the very end of all of our sessions that we like to ask each speaker. So thinking about all that you've learned over the last six months, what do you think would be one thing that you could pick out um, that you wish you had known before becoming an MSL? Known or done differently, so in retrospect. Mm -hmm. huh. Let me think about that for a quick second. One thing that I wish I would have known. Um, can I say one and a half things? Sure. Uh, yeah, one thing for sure is, like I said, uh, understanding how to speak clinically or speak more clinician. If you're really interested in MSL in your free time, I urge you to read publications from clinical journals. So either in your current area of expertise or um, an area 
that you're interested in getting into. And um, I'd compare and contrast, like if you can get your hands on phase three or phase two studies, compare and contrast how those are written, how those are structured and the conclusions they come to and the methods that they're using to analyze the data um, versus an academic paper. It's, it's very different. And while I had read some of that in preparation for the, uh, the role, I do wish I had, I had read more. Um, it's, yeah, it's actually really cool too. Another thing, a lot of people have, uh, I've, I've heard this a lot, um, networking is the key to getting an MSO job, it's who you know, network, and a lot of people are like, oh, how do you build a network? Well, one, coming to things like this and, and seeing people who are, who are doing the role is super important, um, but also realizing that the landscape, if you're coming from academia, the landscape is changing and there's a lot more people that you might have been in the same class as who are a few years ahead of you um, that are getting these different roles in industry. So even if it's not MSL directly, I urge you to stay in contact with those people that might be leaving academia, academia for industry because even if they aren't doing the exact job that you're doing, um, they might know someone that's doing the job that you're doing. And um, a referral or setting up a meeting with, with somebody in the organization that you're interested in is super important. So I did a lot of networking, just meeting random people in pharma and learning a lot about it that way. But another thing that was really crucial to me is um, former postdocs, former classmates, people that I might have seen in lecture a couple of times, just seeing that, oh, they're in an industry job now and just calling them up and going, hey, what's it like for you? Um, what should I know? How did you how did you do it? What's it like for you that, that you're here now? And just having those personal conversations um, and and keeping those connections alive because you never know when they'll come in handy. A lot more of my network came from other people that were at BCM or that I became friends with at conferences because they had the poster next to me. <laughs> Transition to industry, then random people I gave my card uh, to at booths at, at different conferences. So just realize that the connections are already around you and they are continuing to form as more people graduate and transition into these jobs. Well, that's great. I think that's really good. Um, I mean, really advice for all of us. Those are things we can work on now, building a network, reading these clinical papers. Um, yeah, so I think that's really good advice. So we are about at the hour, so I think we will let you go. Um, I want to thank you, Asante, for coming. I think this was a really helpful session and we really appreciate the input that you have as a relatively new MSL because it's very different talking to an MSL who's been in the role for 10 years as opposed to somebody who, who just got the role. So uh, I think we all really much appreciate your time. Thank you, glad to be here. It's, it's a whole new world. And I'm um, sorry for the technical difficulties, I don't, I don't know what happened today. <laughs> they were no <laughs> problem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. All right. Well, thanks um, for this recording. We'll be up on YouTube relatively soon if you guys want to check it out. And just a reminder, connect with us on LinkedIn, join our LinkedIn page, and yeah, stay in touch. Thanks so much, Asante. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a great evening, everyone.